So right now we are at a depth of 3,275 meters, looking at an incredible black smoker hydrothermal vent chimney. That black fluid coming out there is likely between 300 and 400 degrees centigrade. These ecosystems are literally islands or oases amongst what is, I mean, it's really cliche and the deep sea is definitely not a desert, but relatively islands of abundant fauna, islands of life in what is a usually desert-like deep sea floor. Oh, this is so cool. Mining is a terribly dirty industry, and that has has a history of, of killing people and ruining the environment wherever it goes. I'm sure offshore mining will be no different. You know, people want metals and want to drive a car and want a modern way of life, and that means you rip up the environment and pollute the water and pollute the air, smelting and leaching stuff. A sulfide deposit is something the size of the super dome and you're basically going to come in there with a giant cutter head and just you know, cut it down to zero. So I mean, think of, think of the Superdome, you know, 10 stories high and a giant rotating cutter, and, and just imagine coming in and, and cutting that straight to, just straight to the flat level. That's basically what mining is all fancy. The nodules are distributed as small, kind of potato-sized concretions of minerals, manganese and nickel and um, copper and cobalt, and they're just distributed over vast plains on the on the abyssal sea floor. And to pick them up, um, a mining machine, which will be kind of like a potato harvester, will move along and just dig up sediment, pick up the nodules, um, and so it'll disrupt the top 10 or 15 centimeters of sediment, which is most of the habitat of the sea floor, and then pump the nodules up to a surface vessel. Don't forget when you when you drag a, a, a big bulldozer across the bottom. You, you can kill everything that you move across, right? So it's a hundred percent destruction, and, and and then you stir up a cloud, and that lands on some of the other little things a little farther out. There's a sort of a secondary range. First thing that strikes you that it's really quiet and still. You know, current, nothing is moving around. The current, or the currents are very weak. A little bit of current, but you know, not very much. Lots of uh, things like sponges and giant protozoans that form shells or tests that make structure that animals live on. Um, if you look at the sediment, there are all kinds of tracks on the sediment from animals crawling across. And the big animals are what we call the megafauna. They, they're relatively sparse, but you still see them all the time. Um, and they're really bizarre. They're very different from the animals we're used to seeing. The fish look really different. Rat tails and um, a variety of other ophidians. Some of them, they're so unusual that they don't have common names because fishermen don't capture them. The animals there are giant anemones. We have we have actually video footage of an anemone with tentacles that are three meters long. So about 10 feet long and it's just an anemone a meter high and its tentacles just are uh, you know, trailing out and there's very weak current for three meters. Um, there are a lot of weird starfish, brittle stars, um, a lot of different kinds of sponges, glass sponges that can get very big, but a lot of them are small and um, just made of you know, living, living in houses of glass. So it's a you know, really different kind of fauna, and you're all, you know, one of the things when you work there is you're struck with how how much diversity there is, lots of different kinds of animals, how weird they are compared to what we see in other environments. That the communities are very slow to respond. Most animals in the deep ocean have very low rates of metabolism, low rates of growth simply because it's cold, even just a very small scale scientific dredge, we still see the tracks of those 30 years later on the mud. They look like they were made yesterday. The currents are so slow, the activities of the animals are quite low, and they don't recover in these tracks very well at all. So we're looking at communities with recovery times, I would say in excess of 100 years. I think we don't know enough about the deep sea ecosystems to 
really go about deep sea mining in a sustainable way. Uh, when you think about this in terms of sustainability, you have to be careful because we are not talking about a renewable resource. This is mining. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I guess I'm a little disheartened with the um, with how all of this is coming about. I hope that the International Seabed Authority continues to enforce its regulations and that we can get a lot of environmental baseline work done before mining starts in these various habitats. For some of these seamount resources, they occur inside national jurisdictions, 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones of different countries. And right now, the impression I get is that a lot of mining companies are taking advantage of the poverty in developing Pacific Island nations. And they're going to go into these countries EEZs, strip out these mineral resources, pay the governments a tiny fraction of the money that they will make for what will be long-lasting environmental harm to these communities. And so I am, I guess the way to put it is I'm extremely cautious about deep sea mining. I think the deep sea is the last frontier in lots of ways in terms of minerals but also in terms of understanding nature and biodiversity. I mean, it's, it's really, really poorly explored and has all kinds of amazing things to discover in it and insights into biology and evolution and biotechnology. And so I think we, we really need to do a good job of understanding and protecting it before we really kick the poop out of it. <laughs>